Hey, welcome back, everybody. We are back after a week vacation from here we are last week. Um, you may have noticed a little bit of wonkiness on on the app side of things with here we are over, say, the last few weeks, um, as well as some really great news, which if you are on Spotify, you may have noticed that we now have video on Spotify. It's a, it's a feature that they've been slowly, uh, slowly, slowly rolling out. And there's like a massive wait list for and everything. And because, um, because Mind Under Matter is so visual and they were impressed uh, by it, um, they actually reached out to uh, a, 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 this, this platform, Anchor.fm, um, owned by Spotify, reached out to us um, to uh, take advantage of, of the visual things that we do. And so we became one of the very first, there's not, many podcasts at all that have video on Spotify at the moment and they're very slowly being added. It's actually amazing. I've, I've looked through to find all of the different comedy or science podcasts and hardly any of them have it. So um, they also hooked me up with, uh, with getting here. We are on there as well. Super excited about it in the transition over there. A couple things went wonky uh, we copy and pasted some wrong code here and there and in the transition. And you may have noticed a while back, uh, uh, some of your apps here we are, wasn't showing up at the time I'm recording this. Uh, there's still a duplicate on Apple podcast and it's also not on, um, uh, on audible podcast, but there's duplicate mind under matters on there. You, you at the time we ch we moved over, if you searched here, we are mind under matter. Would pop, uh, a whole mess of stuff happened. It was uh, super. Uh, it was a frustrating. Um, you wouldn't think you'd make one little coding error, <laughs> and uh, and it been trying to fix things ever since. Anyway. Uh, the main thing is we're just excited to take advantage of it. It's not just that there's a whole bunch of other features that come with the service and it's available everywhere just because they happen to be owned by Spotify. You can still listen, watch everywhere as other apps add a video. Uh, we hope to be the first um, taking advantage of that as well. So we have no bias to any one company other than um, whichever one is is uh, uh, giving us the uh, most opportunity in terms of function and tools. So super excited about that. And we had the Mind Under Matter season two premiere come out last week. So we retooled everything. We got new cameras. I got a, a new, I'm, I'm even looking right now, I'm, I'm kind of just getting started for the day. My eyes are still a little red from not having totally woken up. Wouldn't have noticed that before. And now I have I have a new studio with a, a better camera, better lighting, and um, things like that, especially in terms of motion. It's a lot of stuff that the average person wouldn't notice, but if you saw it side by side, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that is much better. Um, and so now you'll, you'll be able to more readily see my, um, my many flaws on, uh, on various bad, uh, beard days and things like that, that I'm having. Um, so that's very exciting. And then at the same time, uh, like I, I mentioned on here before we, we are, uh, right in the thick of, of launching a camp out festival um, for uh, for Mind Under Matter, but it's also going to be a Here We Are um, component as well. That's going to be in Raleigh in September, sep Friday, September 9th to Sunday the 11th. There's going to be a bunch of live podcasting, including a live Here We Are podcast where we're going to be talking about the evolution of 
festivals and ceremonies and what modern day hunter gatherers, how, how they kind of, uh, what sort of things they do when, when they get a bunch of people together to, for festivities. Um, so having some, some Duke professors for that, I'm actually trying to build out a section of the camp out festival for like a, a science book fair with a bunch of, uh, Duke professors that have, uh, that are awesome science authors. And so we don't have the tickets online yet. That's one of the many, it's like lawyers and getting like all the adulty sort of things, making sure there's gotta be like security and medical staff there and uh, getting terms and conditions and waivers and blah, 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 like actually doing a, doing it professionally, you know, doing it right, uh, requires, um, uh, just a lot of paperwork and pain in the butt, uh, stuff, but we're just so excited, um, about it. And it's something that we're going to build as a community. So if you aren't on my discord where we talk about, uh, about it a bunch, um, send me a message on Instagram or something, or, uh, uh, if you're on my Patreon, you get the Discord link. If you can't afford Patreon at the moment, I would still love to get you on Discord. So, um, Discord's like a, it's like social media, but private, just, just for, just for us and just for, uh, mind under matter, matter. And here we are fans. Um, and there's various channels. So like, like say you're really into news and politics, you can just, go to that channel and see what people are posting about that. Say you hate news and politics. You just never go to that channel. So it's cool. Rather than it being all one feed, you get to pick and choose. And there's a, uh, there's a camp out channel. So you can go and see all of the chatter going on about all of the fun ideas we are doing there. So that's why we had last week off. Cause we have a zillion things going on and are just really excited to be making improvements for the show including i don't want to oversell things or over promise rather but i'm starting to put a little more now that um uh, uh professors are kind of back in universities and teaching classes and um i'm i'm going to be putting a little elbow grease into when possible trying to coordinate with various like media departments and and things at universities so that I can have a, a more professional um, setup both audio and video on my guests side of things um, it's going to take a lot more work but I'm constantly trying to improve the quality of this show um, as well as season two of Mind Under Matter. We feel like we we know who we are and we have everything uh, just how we want it in terms of quality and knowing what the show is. And so our, our uh, big effort in this coming year is uh, working on figuring out algorithm stuff and doing promotion and getting on other podcasts and doing the marketing side of things now that we've had a, a year to build out the show that we want. So that's going to have, um, that's going to have impacts for this show as well as we figure out all of that stuff. Obviously that will help, uh, new listeners and viewers find the here we are podcast, which, uh, if, for any of you that have been listening for a little bit, know uh, that it's a super awesome show where we get to have a bunch of of, uh, of uh, researchers and academics that don't often get a platform on other things. And a lot of times it's their first podcasts and we just get to hear so many different um points of view and areas of research and meet so many different personalities on this show. And so, uh, you know, rather than doing the traditional trying to book the biggest name and biggest celebrity, this and that, or do the edgiest, most 
controversial <laughs> this and that for attention grabbing clickbait. I'd rather just figure out how to game the algorithms to to get the show that I want to make that I'm proud of um, to the people that are also uh, interested in in things like this because I I think there is just endless value in this show and uh, uh, not not because of like necessarily what I'm doing but just through happenstance getting to meet so many different. Um, researchers in in topics that i would have never thought about before but it never even crossed my mind to look into i've just bumped into so many uh incredible people researching so many um uh, interesting things that have enriched my life and i want that to happen for you as well so working super hard this show is ad free other than big long winded blabby rants from time to time um uh, but uh, it is kept ad free by patreon so you can go over to patreon.com slash shane moss to support the show our editor, Matt McCool, and uh, my assistant, Rihanna Andrews. If you want to meet them, we just released a free bonus episode of Mind Under Matter where we had the team together. So if you're like, is Shane making up these people? Is he doing all of this himself and then greedily taking that Patreon money all for himself. You get to meet the team. You get to meet my employees, see what their deal is, how we met, and everything else. So check that out if you're interested. And a uh, cool episode today. Super fun guest that just loved chatting about all sorts of things. We get into the philosophy of... Uh, 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 we get into philo philosophy and emotion um is is um kind of the big part of her work and one of those episodes where in the start we just kind of uh, uh hit it off conversationally and just got yapping and um talking about all sorts of other things with just what's going on in the world and all of that so just a real cool fun um conversation and in the second half of the show we dive into her uh work quite a bit more so check that out and you guys are awesome enjoy are we yes where are we here why are we here not entirely clear we are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all it's immensely bizarre here we are hello everybody and welcome to the here we are <laughs> podcast we're gonna have a great episode for you today one of the favorite uh, subjects on the show something that is not only uh incredibly relatable something that we all uh, deal with in life but also something that is just endlessly endlessly fascinating We'll never get down to the bottom of all of it. It's just the <laughs> enormous number of, of, of uh, fields of research that go into studying such a subject are, uh, are just incredibly vast. And so always love talking about emotion on the show today. Uh, and joining me is Cecilia Moon. Thank you, Cecilia, for joining the Here We Are podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me here. I'm like really, really excited about um, this talk and um, talking about emotions and how it might be relevant to people's lives and such. And like your interest in emotions as well. So yeah, thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell uh, tell the listeners and uh, viewers a bit a bit about yourself. Um, so currently I am an assistant professor, term professor, however, at um, the University of Louisville and um, in philosophy. Um, I am also on the job market. So like meant like hundreds and hundreds of other PhDs. Um, I'm on the tenor track job market. Um, and uh, my interest is in research is in um, 
philosophy of emotions, but I actually do interdisciplinary, which is like the point of my monograph. Um, and I um, enjoy psychology, sociology, anthropology, history. It's like I love I love learning in general, also like chemistry, biology. <laughs> so it's kind of um, the emotions, I think, allow me to um, play in various areas that I have a lot of interest in, including also like politics. Um, so like political science and economics, which I just started. I'm teaching my first PPE course um, this semester here at UofL, which I'm like really, really excited about because I actually had never really formally studied um, political science and economics. Um, and when I started teaching this course, I realized like how, how very, very important, but also like the connections between politics, economics, philosophy, but especially emotions. Um, with that can tie those three areas together. It's like, it's really fascinating. And definitely I am filled with lots of ideas for like future work. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, politically and emotionally salient time <laughs> to be, to be talking about oh all my God, of this. Yeah. <laughs> I think the world's gone crazy. So like, yeah, <laughs> like I'm not, That's fair. I'm not sure what happened. I think even but, the crazy people <laughs> would agree with that. Yeah, Like someone <laughs> broke the world. <laughs> like yeah. Something happened. We got into this pandemic and then like, and like, like Trump got elected. <laughs> yep. That was a whole <laughs> situation. <laughs> that then, really happened and people are like yeah whatever it was a thing like maybe he'll be president donald <laughs> trump might be president <laughs> again is that crazy yeah and it's That's, well i think it's especially crazy because he's like being investigated right yeah. and like and i think that is like one of the wildest is things we don't about know American if politics. he's going to literally be in jail or president in, in the <laughs> yeah. next but couple th that of years. Both are possibilities. Very right? real possibilities. Yeah, it will probably of... be one or the other. Probably one of those things will happen. I uh, maybe both. Yeah, but, I mean, but neither my, could my happen. That's is, another is, possibility. What's that? Neither could happen. Neither That's could happen. Too. Only if he dies. I feel like, but really? maybe yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. Not neither. I mean, I. I just wouldn't put, I just wouldn't put a lot of chips on neither. I, I mean, okay, maybe, maybe jail's a little extreme, but like pretty, pretty harsh legal consequences for a yeah. former president. So may, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe not jail, but mm, I don't know. You think if jail. he can get it's, out of going to jail, that that is kind of an indicator that um, he has enough influence and power to actually become president again yeah might be I, that one well, has some su you know that they're in the two <laughs> possibilities are interconnected to a certain extent that if oh, one doesn't happen right then, yeah. then that might actually be an indication of the other one possibly happening yeah i mean i i've never pretended to know much about politics myself i i went through i went through a period um maybe 12 years ago where I tried to get heavily into politics for a bit, decided that, um, it didn't, uh, it, it's not even that I don't like to, it, I, I just felt like there were more special things that I could bring to the table in terms mm -hmm. of it, it, it as, as a comedian, there's, uh, uh, there's a zillion comics that like love trying to talk about whatever the news of the day is and especially back then it was like something would happen and at every late night show would have it and everything and i'd be like you know what everyone else is talking about this i'm going to talk about evolutionary biology or mm -hmm. you know i think mm -hmm. that you, you don't get to hear people talk about very often um so i don't consider myself to be um an expert by 
any means whatsoever. I don't even expect myself to be uh, above average in my <laughs> in my political knowledge. Um, but uh, I, I would say the whole Trump thing was definitely when I w- was like, oh, I guess I just don't. I guess I just don't get people, and I guess I don't understand how politics uh, yeah. work because I. I wouldn't have seen that happening. And then and then not only that, but it wasn't even like a really a fluke thing because then then like the the Trump style then started taking off globally and then other people could kind of yeah. use those same tactics of yeah. like wow, the this guy really speaks their mind and yeah. and people not understanding the difference between someone saying something unpopular or saying something they actually believe in it being the truth. Uh-huh. Like people, people think like if someone's being honest, that they're hearing the truth, which uh-huh. someone uh-huh. can believe something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That yeah. Isn't true <laughs> yeah, yeah. at all. Um, and so like all of that stuff that was like, I don't know. I feel like I gave, this is going to sound really snobby to say, but, it's it's of a bunch of people that got Donald Trump elected president. I think that I gave people way more credit than uh, um, than I probably should have. And then uh, Trump got elected. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that was just assuming too much of people's ability to uh, assess it, reality. Yeah, well, there was a lot of interference in terms of like the way in which Trump got elected. Right. Mm-hmm. So especially with social media and things like that. So one thing that I think is really interesting about like um, politics, um, especially also if you're interested in evolutionary biology, right, is that if you think about it, right, politics kind of gives us insight into like how human beings like evolve, right? Mm -hmm. Because part of like the way in which evolution occurs, right, is that like, you know, certain like groups and characteristics and so on and so forth, right? Like they emerge in individuals and then there's like competition and so on and so forth. And then certain characteristics get tamped down and certain characteristics get, you know, heightened and so on, all in terms of like a group response, right? So it's it's like interactions, right? And that's like politics for human beings, right? right? So it's like, you know, whatever happens in, in terms of like a culture, right? Or, you know, a politic, like a political environment, right? Um, I think there, you can say, right, there are connections to the kinds of evolutionary impacts that those make, right, on individual people and just like the groups that are of that culture. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the more depressing aspect of it is, (laughs) has always been not, not that there was, like, I don't care that there's Donald Trump's in the world, there's always going to be uh, like con uh, people and and like obnoxious people trying to get up to attention and yeah. be outrageous or or whatever. But but it's it's more concerning when enough people uh, fall for it. And so, and I'm also I'm also slightly less concerned with um, the. Uh, all the interference stuff, which is still a problem, it's happened during the pandemic and everything else, is still less concerning than just the bottom up emergence of like I don't think there's enough interference <laughs> to account for the level of horrific decision making yeah, that's happening at yeah. like population <laughs> levels. I'm not saying it's not a thing and it's not a threat and yeah and everything yeah. else. But that's that's just generally I I tend to appreciate and gravi- uh, gravitate toward the bottom up emergent ideas more than some of the top down um ones or or at least that's just what I'm I'm more yeah. interested in thinking about. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in terms of like Trump, like I will say this, and I think, you know, a lot of people might be like really shocked if I said this because, you know, I'm a feminist. <laughs> like Trump is like a huge misogynist, right? Um, like I, I don't think that he should be president, right? 
But I think that um, his presidency could have gone better, right? Um, if not for the political like fighting between you know Republicans and Democrats, right? And like um, the fact that he was advised by people who were not interested really in the well-being of the country, right? But they were like, you know, dollar signs were really what they were interested in, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like one of the big problems, right? But I think that, um, uh, like, I think if, which is difficult to do, but if you took away like his misogyny, right? And like, he was, and he was better advised, right? And he took the advice like that people gave him um, in a better way, right? I think that he, his, his presidency, like, wouldn't be so, like, shocking, number one, and so, like, you know, hated, yeah. number two, right? I mean, so I think that he could have done things better, but I think that he was also in a, in a situation, I'm not trying to be an apologist for Trump, but I think no. that there, because there are parts no, of him, I, I think, that I, he, like, you think, oh, maybe he's trying to be a good person, right? So you're like, there's this part of him that seems to suggest, like, it's possible that he could be a good person, but then he ends up doing these other things that you're just like, Oh my God, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, yeah. You're a horrible person. <laughs> Listen, I'll, I'll be the first one to agree that if, if Trump would have been an entirely different person, his presidency could have, <laughs> could have gone a whole lot better. I mean, one thing that he saying. does really well is, and this is like going back to like the topic of this, this talk is like, he, he, connects emotionally right yeah really well with his audience right yeah. and i think that is what made him a really great speaker right which got a lot of people's attention the problem was what he was saying <laughs> was horrible mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I I have trouble even giving them that much credit, to be honest. So as as a as a comedian, I I just it, there's uh, I guess I've always been a little bit of a comedy snob as well, and I was always <laughs> like the comic that liked making the back of the room laugh, the the uh -huh. comics in the back of the room laugh, and and uh, uh, you, you know it, it would be like it would be like giving a talk and trying to. Uh, giving a public talk, trying to like impress the other scientists in the room rather than trying to like, oh, wow, the uh, like a, an audience with like your volcano, the general like, audience, foaming yeah, yeah, thing yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, and and um, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of comics that instead just love uh, they just they're in it to feel those laughs and they just love pandering like the easy yeah. like, headliner in a box. And basically there's most clubs even have, you go into the green room and they'll have a list of like, here's the sports team that they like. Here's the, here's the rival sports team. Here's the, here's the town that people say there's like crackheads or whatever <laughs> or drug uh, that you can, uh, here's the, here's the hick town. Here's the, like, it, here's all of these local stereotypes that if you just reference these things, people will be like, Oh yeah, my gosh, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you can just kind of go into any local truck stop and, um, and just see the kind of bumper stickers and, and things like that. And, and have a sense of like, Oh, okay, here's, these are the colors that they, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. like of their, teams or whatever and here's you can get a sense of things in a hurry and then you can go out and you can just pander and like get it laughs everywhere and to me it doesn't take a tremendous amount of skill it takes an absence of caring um oh, and like a willingness <laughs> <laughs> a willingness to just uh, have no regard for <laughs> for uh anything saying anything of quality but a, and trump does that well i, I think say. that's interesting that you say that because here's the thing is um th one of the biggest criticisms i think for those democratic pe presidential candidates right mm -hmm. including hillary clinton um and joe biden is that 
um, they cannot connect with the general audience, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's that they, it, it, the way in which they talk, right? It, it, it is somewhat absent of any kind of emotional, like feeling or tone or some, you know, where it's like they don't quite um, engage, right? The listeners yeah. into caring about what they're talking about. And I think this is actually a general problem for the Democratic Party in general, because I think to a certain extent, um, they and I'm I'm a nonpart. I'm like I'm an independent. So I'm like, I'll, I'm like um, I all? don't like to take sides. <laughs> like you all suck sometimes. That's basically. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I do think the Democratic Party in general, it's like they have a problem with properly communicating um their message right and i oh, think oh sure yeah. <laughs> i mean if you if you were to hold up like hillary and or joe biden and ask me to find things to criticize in them it wouldn't be that uh that difficult but yeah there i don't know there's a little there's a little more going on. you know it it would be it would be one thing if if there was like it, you know when it's when it's some um uh, if it's if it's like a Republican politician that's like connecting with the like the salt of the earth people, and I was a <laughs> farmer veteran, you know this and that, and like I know these people, I get yeah. my hands dirty or yeah. whatever that that usual spiel is, which is also assuming that like everyone, I'm from Wisconsin, not everyone just like lives on a farm. Yeah. And, and like, you know, it's, it's, a, so it's, it's weird that like, tr- like Trump's whole thing was like, that's not his upbringing at all. It was just this impression of a pandering thing that just was clearly just manipulating mm-hmm. um, everyone. And, and also in terms of like Democrats having people that I, I think, um, uh, I mean, I thought, I thought, uh, I thought I thought Obama was one of the greatest communicators I've ever seen. And as as someone that just straight up enjoys watching good communication. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought he was just absolutely incredible. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. people despised him for it. Um, well, still, I guess it depends on the people. I think I mean, didn't doesn't he have in general a pretty high rating yeah. for, for like historically like yeah I thought he had a pretty he's the he's the first president that i actually voted for really yeah before oh, a good he, one. yeah I before think... he ran for president i was like all these other candidates it doesn't matter who i vote for <laughs> they're all they're all yeah. you know basically the same you know they're basically going to do the same thing and when you think about it it's like you know, a lot of what happens, the decisions that get made in a presidency is really not the president. It's the advisors. It's the information that they're given. It's the I always thought it's, that, too. And, like, then pre- <laughs> and then and then Trump became president. I'm like, oh, my gosh, presidents can do way more or not do way more than I ever realized yeah. was possible. I yeah. had no idea. I actually... In hindsight, my view of what a president did was like almost powerless, almost just um, like Figurehead. someone that tours around giving pep talks. Yeah. And that's it. That's what I thought a president was. And then Trump got in there and actually started <laughs> fiddling around with things. And I was like, oh, wow, they actually can do a whole lot of stop it's crazy it's unfortunately kind of with crazy trump it's like with negative consequences to a yeah. certain extent although i will say like the um you know the checks that we all received right for like um relief during the pandemic right yeah like i, I will say there are certain things that trump did i mean not all of them because a lot of them are like really bad like putting a ban on muslims like coming into the u.s and like yeah. you know it's it's like building a wall like that is now falling apart right i mean there are a lot of things that he did that were bad yeah. but like there are certain things where like when you know the i think the debate was in the senate about like whether or not those checks should go out and he was just like i'm just going to 
sign an executive order. I think that's what happened where like Mm -hmm. the relief checks went out. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then there are times where he was like, so his reason for not having a mask mandate, I think, and like closing down schools, I think they were concerned. I think the advice that he got early on was um, if you have people who are isolated for too long, right? Um, they're going to mm-hmm. go crazy. Like they're, they're going to like, you know, they could like get into depression and, and all of that was correct. But I think the way in which he used that information was problematic because they didn't consider the point of time. Right. So like, so like it, it, it's, it probably, you know, was the case that early on in the c- pandemic, we should have shut things down. Right. And that everybody should have stayed inside and so on. And then once things got safer, that, you know, things should have been opened back up so that because I think now it's like maybe a little bit before this, we are seeing the consequences of the kinds of concerns that like Trump had about psychological effects of being isolated. Right. So like, you know, like, I mean, people are, there are well, a there's lot also psychological- of angry people, a yeah. lot of people who are just like, even on planes, when you're just trapped, like you would think on a normal travel day, right? Like, like you would not expect people to just get punched in the face or like, you know, like flight attendants to get punched. But now it's just kind of like, well, that it, it happens, right? Like, but that I think is an indication of like how highly strung people are right now with all the emotional stuff that they had to go through. And then now we're like in this, I mean, we're not technically in a world war, but we're kind of in a world war. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like Ukraine and Putin, thankfully, like they withdrew from Kiev, but now they're headed north, I guess, or something like that. So it's like, you know, and I don't think the consequences of the response that the Biden administration is, has taken, right. And globally too, um, has really hit us here, home here in the U.S. Except for like gas prices, right? But like as things continue to also affect us econ- economically, right? It's like, oh no, there's like this pandemic, and now there's this war, and like people are already. High. <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. it's like not good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think there's certainly on an emotional level a lot more going on than than like whatever. Um, restrictions or mandates people did or, or, or actually followed. I, I mean, I, I don't think masks were ever a mental health, uh, issue. I, I think it was, uh, I think it was more of just people, um, not wanting to be told what to do creates, uh, mental health. If, if people are like, if you look at, um, like say Sturge's uh, motorcycle rally was the first large event um, uh, in uh, 2019 or, or, or sorry, in, tw- in the, in the fall of 2020. Um, uh, and, um, and that was, they were refusing to wear, my, well, I dug into it and they'd, they had gone to court for the years just a couple years earlier for the ability to wear face coverings because huh. they they are motorcycle riders and they they want to wear bandanas and things like that and and huh. um but they are considered like you know you'd get pulled over or something like that sometime or you couldn't wear one inside of a a, a store and and so it's like they, these were these are like a specific group of people that normally wear m- more face coverings than anyone else on the planet <laughs> and then were protesting this with like needing to rip it off they were having uh-huh. sneezing contests in bars oh during a pandemic because um people want to fight against re- so yeah i guess i guess like yeah i i can uh, like all of the there's a lot more going on, like death and fear of death and sickness and and losing family members and having people get sick and not know what's happening and and even even less people wanting to go out and collect indoors with or without a mandate, which affects businesses like mine. 
is all things that cause mental health, not just the isolation aspect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if you ask me, but yeah, I mean, I mean, every, every time Trump says something good about vaccines, I'm like, yes, <laughs> keep going with that. I'm not saying everything that he's ever done. Yeah. Um, he got yeah. wrong. Just almost all of it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just want to, I like, if I could talk to him, I'd be like, you know, you could, you could use your power for good. And guess what? people, more people will like you. <laughs> Cause I think to a certain extent, like uh, what Trump cares about the most, right. is like money. <laughs> it's like money, his family and that people like him. Honestly, I think yeah. those are like his three top priorities. And like, I just want to tell him like, you know, like use your power for good. And then more people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would say that he like, wants don't be attention a hater, like... more than being liked. Like, I, oh. I, I, don't, I don't I don't think that it bothers him much that people don't like him. Oh, okay. I, I, th I think that it, it's it's like the he's he's just a, he's just an algorithm, in my opinion, like YouTube. <laughs> uh, YouTube videos are popular, not just for the number of thumbs up. Uh, but they also if you have a lot of thumbs down yeah, yeah. too just views they're in general also popular be yeah. because people are having a salient emotional reaction one way or another so in some cases depending on what a given youtube channel is going for much yeah. like howard stern used to get just as many listeners that would like hate everything that he had to say as would yeah. like his it was like youtube does that as well people the youtube will promote videos that people hate just yeah. because it causes a, a, a visceral kind a of visceral, response like, yeah, just like, yeah yeah and, and then it keeps them Trump's engaged into. it like keeps them continuing to like interact yeah. with the video and stuff so i think like what? I will say, well, I'll say this. I think sure. with everyone, right, it's going to be the case that, like, there are going to be haters and, like, likers, right? So, like, there's going to be people who hate you and people who like you. And I think my whole point is, like, you know, use his power for good is, like, and, yeah, this is, like, a huge, you know, value-laden judgment, right, that I'm asking Trump to make um, is, like, you know, get the get the people who should be like your haters to hate you <laughs> and the people who should be the people who like you to like you right meaning like you know i think people should want like people who are who care about other people and like who are you know like you know care about like you know unity and things like that i would think that's who you would want to like you and then the people you would want to hate you are the people who you know who are really divisive and just like racist and you know things like that but that's not how trump seems to have picked his <laughs> his likers and his haters yeah yeah i think just anyone that's given him the time of day is he's a fan of oh yeah seems. yeah see that's sad that's kind of i think <laughs> you don't think yeah, that's sad because it's like i think it's very i don't know indicative of u.s culture however right um, especially in terms of us being like, a, and I'm not like, you know, I mean, people are gonna be like, she's a communist and whatever, you know, but like, I think that's very indicative of a capitalistic culture, right? Where it's like, mm -hmm. you, you, you start out in life. So I'm teaching business ethics. Um, and I'm also teaching a, a politic, a philosophy, polit politics and economics course. And, you know, we're talking about like capitalism and business and, but it, within the context of ethics as well. So like, you know, how are we supposed to respond to each other? And like, it's interesting because, right, um, we, outside of business life, right? I was just speaking with my students the other day. Like we make ethical decisions all the time, right? And the kinds of ethical decisions that we make are, are typically ones like this, right? Like, oh, if you care about someone, like don't harm them. Right. Um, and especially if you care about them enough that like you want them to care about you, like don't do harmful things to them. Right. But mm -hmm. then so that you might think, oh, that's like a pretty sensible ethical principle to follow. Right. And then you're like, well, how, how do you practice this in business? Right. So you like, can you take this ethical principle and like transfer it to to business context and what, what happens? And then you think, well, 
No, just because you're friends with someone doesn't mean you can't be aggressively competitive to like the point of trying to put them out of business, right? And then like it could happen so that like, you know, through this aggressively competitive interaction in the end, someone wins, but then both gains because, um, you know, one person like either buys the other person out, right? Or like, you know, when one person concedes to take their business out of the market, right, they end up getting a share of the business that remains, right? So this is like what happened with like um, uh, Uber in China, right? So, <laughs> and then you're like, well, I guess if you make a lot of money, like to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter if you like harm <laughs> the people <laughs> that mm-hmm. you're like interacting with. It, as long as in the end, like they make some money too. It's like really, really weird how this it does that. Like money yeah. has this tendency to like just shift the way in which we think about ethics and what we think is like appropriate, right? In terms of sticking with our ethical principles. It's odd. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it's, I think money is kind of, um, uh, Money, money is just such a straightforward and simple way to quantify things. You, you know, where where it's where it's uh, this is. I mean, I have through almost my entire life not made like any money guided <laughs> decisions to my own detriment i've i you know i'm a i'm the cliche starving artist i i i value so many other things or certainly have until i just completely ran out of money and i'm like oh, money money's kind of a thing sometimes but the but it, it's it's and, and i'm not saying i'm not saying this like this is a good thing that money does this i'm saying that Every human is trying to figure out what the fuck is going on, like from the day that they're born. And we're all in exchanges constantly. Like right now, you and I are each giving each other time and energy and we're giving the viewers time and energy. And we're also bidding for, you know, I'm I'm bidding for like more listeners to want to listen to a show for for longer and give me their time in exchange for this uh, entertainment and uh, interesting conversation and maybe learning a thing or two and then maybe they'll support me on patreon with that and if i have that money that i could pay the editor and and it's like everything in if you think in terms of just you know your health uh, falling apart or breaking an ankle or something like that and trying to put a value on that and okay what surgery is worth it to walk perfectly and it, 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 it's just everything's a mess mm-hmm. uh, always was before <laughs> money but but things were much the same through much of our evolutionary history so so it was at least like kind of solid and str- but now things move and change so fast that I think money isn't it is an easy not i'm not saying this in a pro money way i i'm saying it's just kind of an easier thing to assess and attach to and kind of see on paper it's a way of simplifying the messy chaos of just all of the social transactions that we're always Uh, making so you think i think well so that's something to say about money as a medium right because it's like if you think about money as like a medium exchange um, and really, like, what kind of value does it have of its own? Um, I would say to the point that you can invest it and, like, just have it sit and grow, like, a lot. But <laughs> but I think um, I think what I'm kind of thinking about more so is, like, um, the structure of capitalism, right, as an economic system, as a way in right. which it actually structures and guides the kinds of exchanges that people um, enter into, right? So like understanding capitalism as like a way in which, a specific way in which interactions are structured, right? Um, I think gives us a really good insight into like the actual culture 
right, of like a capitalistic society, especially one like the United States, where it's not just capitalistic, because there are a lot of capitalistic societies that are not quite the same as the US, right? But these are the ones that are not individualistic. So you have like capitalistic, but you also have individualism, which gives you a, a very different kind of culture, right? Versus like a culture like China, which is now capitalistic, but it's also very like commutarian. It's very communal. Um, and I think that's like actually one of the strengths of China. And this is also why they're like gaining as a world power, because like, for example, in global business, right? Um, American companies, many like inter companies outside of China, right? Um, find it very, very difficult to get established in China, right? And one of the ways in which that happens is because of their community values, right? So not only is, does the government, right? Not only do they make it difficult for outside businesses outside of China to actually get established in China, right? But it's also the case that, you know, the companies and the individuals, right? The people who work in China, like the people, they like, you know, basically rally around the Chinese companies that are in competition with the American companies that are trying to get established in China. And then eventually the, the American companies lose out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really, really interesting how that happens. Whereas if you think about it, the way that it, things work, especially because of individualism in the United States, right? And it's interaction with capitalism. Um, what do we have here? We don't have jobs being protected, right? American jobs being protected by the government and by the citizens of, of the United States. What we have is more globalization, more outsourcing, right? So if you can't break a teacher strike, right? Um, at a certain, in a certain city, what, what happens? They will go and get right? Um, workers from teachers from other countries like the Philippines, right? Um, highly well-trained, right? English is one of their, I think it's their, like what, I think they have two, two languages. It's like English and Tagalog maybe, but don't quote me on that. But, you know, they're well-trained, right? They're good teachers and they bring them into the U.S. to break the strike, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff, if you think about it, it's because the, of the individualism that's operating, right, in the mm -hmm. United States where the, the schools or the school districts, right, they're thinking about, well, we need teachers. We're not going to pay the teachers more. So this is what we're going to do. But notice how now what you have is American jobs, right, being outsourced, mm. right? It's, it's a weird kind of thing. So I, I, I want to, we'll, and we'll get back to this conversation as well, but I want to, this is very, very often times on the show. This is, this is how it goes. This is like uh, my, my last episode we are going to, uh, I had the guest on to talk about sustainability. And then I spent the first half of the episode asking him about the cabin that he lived <laughs> in just because this is how conversations go. This is a yeah. casual show. And it just, if the conversation's interesting, I'm going to keep it going, but I do feel like uh, we should take one step back because we introduced this uh, uh, this as we're going to be talking a bit about emotion <laughs> um, <laughs> today, and we should probably interject a, a, a little bit more of that um, for a moment. So I just want to, uh, not that there's a wrong, right or wrong way to do this, and I'm already showing people how much I overthink everything in my own <laughs> damn head. But because I want to make sure and plug your book and everything and, and get into your background a little bit. So so could you um, first off, your book is the Interdisciplinary Foundations for the Science of Emotions. And um, uh, that's unification without um, consilience. Uh, consilience. Consilience. Uh -huh. um, What's consilience mean again? So Forgive consilience my... is like, it, it, it sounds kind of good. It's kind of compromised the way that I, I kind yeah. of think about it. Right. So um, it's actually, um, so the, that name unification without consilience was, um, I have that there because uh, I think it's O 
E. Wilson or, or W. Wilson, he wrote a book um, called Consilience. And it was a um, interdisciplinary approach that he was taking. And I think it was in biology and uh, I read it, I promise. But it was like, I was like, what was it about? So I think it was melding biology and po- politics, I believe, from what I can remember. And the thing is, though, historically, he got a lot of backlash about his book. Um, and the criticism was that um, his interdisciplinary approach was not interdisciplinary enough. So he was taking a certain perspective and he considered that perspective to be the, the one that was most significant. And he was judging other disciplines basically from within that perspective. And so when I was working on my book, right, so I, I wanted to provide an interdisciplinary approach that is grounded in a certain perspective. So it is philosophical, um, but that wouldn't be susceptible to a lot of unfair criticism about me being too philosophical when I thought about or looked at or judged, right, or assess various kinds of theories, right? So I'm, I'm hoping that I did the job right, where it's like, you know, you can clearly see that um, the interdisciplinary approach that I provide is a philosophical approach, but it gives due consideration um, and fair consideration to the contributions of other disciplines, especially psychology, um, but also sociology and anthropology and linguistics. And what's your, uh, what's your background? My background is in philosophy. <laughs> so I, um, I was a philosophy undergrad um, at UNLV. And then um, I got my, so I went through after I got my, so as an undergrad, I was one of these students where I was like, um, I don't know what I'm going to major in. So I'm going to just take my core classes and then take electives based on like just what I want to take. Right. And it just happened to be the case that I ended up taking a bunch of electives in, in philosophy. And I thought, well, obviously that means that I really like philosophy classes. So I decided to major in philosophy. And then after I finished my BA, I thought, well, I do want to go to graduate school, but um, I wanted to do something practical because, you know, I bought into that whole line of like, you're going to be a starving <laughs> philosopher if you like, you know, just get a, a degree in philosophy, right? So I mm-hmm. went and I got a master's in ethics and policy studies, um, also at UNLV. Um, but then it turned out I had to write a thesis for my MA in ethics and policy studies. And it turned out that I wrote, my thesis was all theoretical, <laughs> right? So it was, it was a, a thesis assessing theories of policy analysis, right? In terms of how well they fulfill democratic ends. Right. And so it was all theory. And I thought, oh, maybe this means I should go into philosophy, right? And get a PhD in philosophy. And to a certain extent, I've always wanted to, like since high school, pursue like philosophy as my career. But, you know, I think during that first master's, I was just like, oh, maybe I should do something more practical. I will say, though, getting that um, MA in ethics and policy studies really did help me. Um, in the long run, because it helped me realize the connection between practice and theory, right? So I think that is like one of the most important connections that like theorists and practitioners like need to make, right? When they do whatever they do, because I think if they get too lost in just the practical or too lost in just the theory, um, both goes like awry. Right. Mm -hmm. So like the theory and the practice working together kind of keeps a balance, I think, in both. So I think it's really important that both happen. And then, um, yeah, so then I got a a Ph.D. at um, Arizona State University um, and I am now doing what I'm doing. (laughs) You're at ASU currently? No. So I am now at um, University of Louisville. So I've been on oh, the that's job. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got so I got my PhD in 2014. So it's like been a while, and like I've had academic positions, and you know, but in most cases they're like term positions or visiting positions, or um, so they're like limited contract positions. Um, and I think I will say this: it's this is just the situation that I'm in is just 
the case for the majority of the people in the academic job market. This is like, this is just basically what, like, this is how long it takes to get a job in the, in the, in the academic job market for many, many people. I'm not going to say that there are not people who get jobs um, right out of graduate school into a tenure track position, right? Because that, that definitely does happen. But I will say that those are the handful of lucky people, right? Mm. And most of us um, go from a term position to a term position to a term position until eventually, hopefully, right, uh, we end up with a tenure track job, right? And mm. I think a lot of people end up actually leaving and just doing something else. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it does sound rough. I mean, I've I've interviewed a lot of scientists, and they always seem, um, they always seem exceedingly busy, no matter what stage of their career that they're at. I, mm-hmm. I kind of, it always seems a little overwhelming um, to me. Uh, let's talk about your book. Uh, what? Uh, how do you want to uh, introduce it? We have we have another like thirty minutes or so. Where we can, uh, you can kind of introduce people to some of the main topics and everything. Okay. In it. Yeah. So, um, in my book, um, Interdisciplinary Foundations for the Science of Emotion, um, one thing that I first want to mention is so when you re- read the title, I know this sounds kind of like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe she's talking about that, but the, it's, it's Interdisciplinary Foundations for the Science of Emotion. And it's, um, with not a plural S like, so it's just emotion. And there's, a, there's a thing about this in, in research on emotions um, or emotion. So when we're talking about emotion, right, we're, we're talking about the category emotion, right? So how is emotion different from like something like affect, right? Or how is emotion different from something like belief? How is emotion different from something like desire? So on and so forth, right? Um, and some people in the in the research field, right, um, deny that emotions can be categorized in this kind of way, where you can say that they constitute a, a distinct category, right? And so people like to use emotions, right, with an S at the end of it, to kind of reflect this idea that. Um, emotions is kind of a very um, amorphous category that's broad that can, can include affects, which you might not necessarily call an emotion and like other things, you know, so it's kind of, it, it, there's, it's, there's a theoretical position that I'm kind of taking <laughs> with the title of the book. Um, and I will say, I don't think that, um, you know, I, obviously it's like, we don't really know, right? Because the whole question about emotions, right, is is like, what are emotions, <laughs> right? Like, what is this kind of, if it's a thing, if it's a process, if it's a, a state, a conscious state, an unconscious, right? Like, what kind of thing it is? How, how do we define it, right? Um, and I think there's there's something to be said to say, look, we can't define it specifically with these like necessary sufficient conditions as criteria, right? And I want to say, um, yeah, that's a possibility, right? And I think most people in emotion research are going to say that's a possibility, but I think we need to leave open the possibility that it can be defined, right? And I'm of the people who's like putting my, <laughs> my chip in that box <laughs> and saying, you know, no, I think we can um, define emotion in terms of perhaps certain various necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, but yeah, so the approach that I'm taking is, is it is interdisciplinary, it is philosophical, but it, it is not like anything goes kind of approach. I do have a certain theoretic, I have certain theoretical positions that I am taking. Um, but I will say for the monograph, right, um, the intention of the monograph was actually that I was writing them for um, graduate students and professionals who were interested in continuing to pursue um, philosophy of emotion from a disciplinary, interdisciplinary perspective, right? And I I basically, what, like, the the thing that, like, I had in my mind, right, when I was, like, writing it was 
Um, here's, here's all this stuff that I ended up learning and figuring out during my research about emotions and not just emotions, but the discipline. The discipline, right? The area of research in interdisciplinary um, emotions. And like, I think this is what, you know, I wish I had known <laughs> when I was interested in, right? When I was starting out, getting interested in the philosophy of emotions, like, this is the stuff I wish I had known, right? Um, and that's kind of what I put in my book. Um, so, you know, I hope pe- it helps people. <laughs> I will say so, it does. Go ahead. I'm super curious. Uh, can you feel like this might be a tough one? I'm, I'm maybe putting it. What do you, What do you got going on there? What's that mug? Oh, you, this is <laughs> this is my <laughs> my notorious no, RGB. <laughs> nice. What cup? It says um, never underestimate the power of a girl with a book love it <laughs> <laughs> this is my all right well i won't underestimate you <laughs> um so i was just about to underestimate your ability to do uh to answer this question okay and now i'm not going to <laughs> um it's an ambitious one how um could you help me out in maybe uh, explaining in your view how emotion is defined within different disciplines like obviously you don't have to rattle them all off but like maybe maybe a couple uh maybe a couple greatest hits a a few that interest you or or mm, are maybe some of the more popular uh, theories or definitions out there? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, this is actually pretty good, I think, the question, because um, the one of my first chapters, um, it's actually like chapter two and three. So the chapters two and three deal with um, the taxonomy of theories of emotion um, interdisciplinary-wise. Right. Cool. So with- <laughs> well, I want to I want to get into that uh, a little bit as well. Or maybe, oh, you're, okay. yeah, maybe yeah. you're doing maybe yeah. you're going there now. Yeah, yeah, but- I'm going there. Yeah, I'm going okay, there. Cool. So in psychology, right, psychology is a discipline that I most off like I work with the most. Right. And um, when I was researching emotions and psychology, there are like all sorts of different kinds of theories that you can have. So there's like basic emotion theories. Um, there's, um, psychological constructive theories, there's social constructive theories. Um, and then there's like, oh, what's that other one? Um, oh, it's like, it's, it's a kind, it's a version of psychological constructive theory, but they, they take a perspective that is, if I think of it, I'll bring it up. (laughs) So there's at least these three kinds of theories in psychology, um, there's also different kinds of theories in philosophy as well. So there's like cognitive theories, there's non-cognitive theories. Philosophy also has social constructionist theories. And um, what I did in my um, research, during my research is I was trying to figure out how I could actually get outside of the disciplinary taxonomy, right? So speaking about um, different kinds of theories of motion from within a discipline, right? And to try to provide a taxonomy, a way of understanding what each of these kinds of theories are getting at that can help um, people across disciplines, right, find um, their, like, the affinity theory, right, the theory that melds with their theory in another discipline, right? Mm -hmm. So I um, provide this taxonomy where it's, it's actually just four categories. So it's realism, it's instrumentalism, um, it's, um, eliminativism and eliminative realism. And what I argue is that, um, basically all those theories or most of those theories in across various disciplines, right. Can be categorized under these four taxonomic categories of theories of motion. So like realist theories are theories that actually believe, right. That, um, There is some kind of emotion, and I'll put this in more materialistic language, right? Emotion system, right? That is like 
a dedicated like system of emotion that, you know, it can operate like cognitively and also physically, right? So there could be physical conditions or criteria that like where we can say, hey, here are the boundaries of the emotion system, right? Um, and they have actual like causal consequences and causal relations that are of the system itself, right? And this would be like an, a realist kind of theory, right? And then you have an instrumentalist kind of theory. Um, and if you want, if it makes, if it helps, right? Like I can name some names. So like um, with like a realist kind of theory, like Martha Nussbaum, you might say is like a realist kind of theory. Um, you might also say like Jesse Prince's theory is like a realist kind of theory. In psychology, um, the, oh uh, gosh, I'm going to be <laughs> People are going to be like, I can't believe, oh, Paul Ekman. <laughs> like, you forgot his name, what? So Paul Ekman, who's um, very well known for his basic motion theory, right? That's like a realist theory. Um, and then you have like an instrumentalist theory, which is like Lisa Barrett Feldman. Her theory is like a, an instrumentalist theory. And I actually argue that Martha Nussbaum's theory can be understood as an instrumentalist theory as well. Um, and this is like one of the insights, I think, that like the categories that I provide kind of can help with. Um, people understanding. So instrumentalist theories, right? So they don't think that there's an actual like dedicated emotion system, right? What they think is that we have um, general purpose and other kinds of dedicated systems, right? That work together in, in like bringing about an emergent kind of experience, which is like an emotional experience, right? So we can't say like emotions are not necessarily like real in the sense that realists want them to be real. Right. However, right, um, they won't deny that there is a kind of realism to what emotions are, right? In the sense that um, they actually have as a category of experiences, right, specific kinds of impact that you can like attribute to like that they are emotions, right? And like Lisa, her way of kind of capturing this is through like conceptual construction, right? So it's like, it's the emotion concepts, right? That like basically um, structure our experiences such that we actually end up having like real emotional experiences, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not real in the sense that like, there's no, like if when I experience anger, there's no anger system in my brain, right? right. There's no anger system in my body that like, gives rise to my anger, right? So that's like an instrumentalist position. So far, I'm more of an instrumentalist, it turns out. Okay, well, I'm a, I'm a realist, so that's good. That's uh, good because right. one of the beauties, right, of, um, I think, research is that um, is talking to people with different ideas, right? People who don't agree with you. And like the reason why I think that's so great is because you learn so much right? In the exchange between your, like your position and the other per person's position to try to figure out like, wait, are we actually disagreeing about this? Cause sometimes people who disagree, right? They're not actually disagreeing about the things that they think that they're disagreeing about. Right. And it's like finding those like points of like real disagreement, right? For me, I'm like, ah, oh, this is it. <laughs> right? so I'm like, yeah. this is, this is the fulcrum, right? Of the debate. And I think like, once we isolate those, right, then we can like stand back and say, okay, well, now we know like what, what can be done, right? In order to move forward. Right. So it's like here, we found the actual disagreement here. Right. So it's like, now, why is it that we disagree? Like, how can we move forward from this disagreement? And like, what are the implications of, of this disagreement? Right. To me, that's like really, really interesting, fascinating stuff. Right? Yeah. I mean, the pros and cons the the pro of people agreeing with you is that sweet, sweet validation that uh, you get to experience. Yeah. So you, you, yeah. Get the, you get that. Yeah. No, but I, I'm a, I'm 100 percent on board with it, what you say, but also enjoy making jokes. At this yeah. <laughs> No, I um, definitely is the case that like, pe you know, having people agree with you is, is very um, validating and also, you know, it just feels really good. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think being trained as like a philosopher, basically, since I was, you know, like in like my undergrad years. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I 
I don't, I wouldn't, I'm speaking for my own experiences, obviously, I think, and also I did speech and debate when I was in high school. So I was always like an argumentative person, right? Me too. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a tendency to find each other and stuff. But yeah. I think like for me, right, um, is having someone agree with me is not necessarily the most enjoyable um, experience. Right. So like, I really love a good challenge and a good debate, you know, and like, as long as it's done in a way that is, um, virtuous. Right. So like, as long as, you know, the person is not being an asshole or, you know, not being condescending or, you know, things like that, I think, um, really good debate should be really, really encouraged. Right. Like it's good to have people disagree, but disagreement for disagreement's sake is a problem. Right. So it's like, also, I don't, I don't like a theatrical disagreement. Yeah, exactly. Well. I, I, I think like going back to politics, I think the idea of like, this is, this person's on this team, this person's on the other team and they're going to have a popularity contest yeah. between the two. I, I think that, um, I, I, as much as I enjoy a good debate, I think one of the, um, what, one of the, uh, pitfalls of the formal debate structure of of like that anyone saw like in in school or whatever where you'd get up on the podium and this person would represent this side and this other team would, is that you're now you're you're now just giving yourself over to all of the cognitive biases you're you're now, you're now just surrendering to confirmation bias and in-group thinking and just all of the all of all of the heavy hitters in in hijacking our perception away from uh, properly assessing objective uh reality and yeah it, that's not always the case because a good debater will consider the other person's point of view and everything mm -hmm. but i i think mm -hmm. it i think it just sets up for failure sometimes but anyway i like arguing too yeah but i think it's also like the case that be you know debates right um can help us go beyond our cognitive biases like they can help us recognize our cognitive biases and then like isolate those away right from the debate it's just that um to be able to do so takes a, a certain amount of skill right um, which is why I think, you know, um, everybody should be trained in philosophical, you know, <laughs> in philosophical, like, you know, debating, like, um, I think in critical thinking logic, these are, I, I think basic skills, right. Um, even in terms of just like the psychological, like basics that we're about cognitive biases, right. Information about like, what are the things that we do, um, that can not only stand in our own way. Right. But also like stand in the way of like cooperative efforts. Right. That we don't even recognize. Right. Um, and I think that like people in general should be taught this kind of information, um, not just in like college, but in high school. Right. But the, the thing is, we don't do that. Right? Our education system, um, you know, I think some schools might be starting to, right? So they're teaching like emotional intelligence, which I think is really, really great, right? But they're not teaching things about like epistemic biases, right? And this whole um, campaign, right? To like get critical theory um, out of our classrooms, right? I think that's a huge problem too. Mm. Hmm. I, um, well, there's another rabbit hole we can dive into, <laughs> yeah. and we're halfway through. We only got two of the. I'm gonna make a note. We only got two of the four categories. Yeah, because we gotta finish these categories. <laughs> Gosh darn it! <laughs> uh, I the categories. We need them. Um, yeah, and the, so let's the, finish the categories. Okay. Then, uh, I mean, we just the thing is, is you and I are going to have endless numbers of topics to talk yeah, about. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> let ourselves go wild. Nothing wrong with that, but the show's only so long. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe I can be on again. Who knows? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so the, 
the third category, right, or one, one of the um, other categories is eliminativism. And so eliminativism um, is like not a very, very widely uh, practice category, right? So James A. Russell is the primary person that I associate with eliminativism, but although he's not like the only one who's an eliminativist, um, his, so the way in which eliminativists think about emotions is that um, there is no, no such thing as an emotion, right? The way that realists think about them, right? Um, and it's not even a constructed, right? Um, emotion itself, it's not even a constructed category. What they want to do is completely like get rid of the use or the reliance of emotion as a, a category itself, right? And so what they would rather have are like um, categories like emotional episodes, right? So they just want to get, so it, it's kind of a terminological debate, right? That um, Jim is having like with the rest of the emotion community, right? Where he, he just doesn't like the category emotion being used, but it's, it's theoretically underwritten, right? By his position that um, emotions don't exist, right? So Base, so this is something that um, that eliminativists share with instrumentalists, right? Because both of them believe that emotions, as, emotions as a category, right? The emotion category is not real; it doesn't really exist. There is no really real emotion system, right? But whereas um, someone like Lisa, right, who's an instrumentalist, wants to maintain the usefulness of the emotion category as a construct right? As a psychologically constructed category, right? Um, Jim, right? James A. Russell, he wants to get rid of that, right? And he okay. wants people to start talking about emotional episodes rather than emotions. But however, he will grant that there are things like um, the kinds of emotions, right? So there are things like um, anger, shame, um, uh, fear, right? These these kinds of emotions exist, right? What his main concern is that you can't find features that that cohere all of these kinds of emotions into one specific distinct category. Okay, and and what's but I I mean I guess the I think I'm following for the most part, but then when you say but he likes these emotional uh, emotion episodes. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm unclear of what, what he means by that. Without... What emotional episodes are. Yeah. So yeah. his way of understanding emotional episodes, like he thinks that there are what we can say are like events that are emotional events. Right. So like if I have, you know, if I get like angry for whatever reason, right from the time that my anger started to the time that my anger ended, he will call that whatever happened during that time, an emotional episode. Mm -hmm. Right. So the use of this word, right. Um, tracks the referent of the thing that he's interested in as the object of inquiry. Okay. Right. But what he's saying is it's not, it's not something that is a system in the brain right? Or a system that's in the brain body, right? What he's saying is it's a lived experience kind of thing that is an emotional episode. And then you could take that experience and you can um, think about it and study it in various different ways. So one way that you can study it is to take a materialistic approach and think about like the physical neuro kinds of um, interactions and events that occur, right? Or you can also think about the more socially constructed stuff, like um, the language that we use to talk about our, that experience, right? And the values and meanings that are part of that experience and the behavioral interactions and responses that are specifically principled, right? By the way that we think about what like something like anger is or what fear is or something like that. So he calls these like emotion scripts, right? And so you might say like, there are, emo every culture has emotion scripts. And for every emotion, you can say there's a kind of script, a way that we think that the emotion should go, the emotional episode should go in order to make that emotion um, something that is 
you know, anger instead of fear, right? Or joy instead of anger or something like that, right? But he denies that all of these can be then placed under um, a category of emotion. Okay. And, and this it just, can you refresh me? Didn't, wasn't a, a, a big part of Ekman's more popular work, um, cross-cultural analysis oh. of emotion or am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something? So he's, so as a, um, basic emotion theorist, right. Um, one of the principles of basic emotion theory is that, um, certain emo- or emotions, right. Like anger, fear, so on are universal, um, uh, across right. like human beings. Right. Um, because they're like species specific, right. So it has to be the case that, um, if basic emotion theory is tr- true, you should be able to find, um, emotions of the same kind across different cultures. Right. And what's interesting is, right. So that's a, that's a debate between like emotion like BET theorists and also psychological constructionists and social constructionists like um, Lisa Barrett Feldman and James A. Russell, who are both psychological constructionists and also Rom Hare, who's like a social constructionist, right? They, all of them disagree with, um, with uh, Ekman. Right. Which and what was what was Ekman's? Just remind me what were Ek, some of Ekman's original um, findings regarding that? Because it, it, I'm now it's been it's been years since I've I've uh, I, I'm I'm having some very old memories coming back now. Oh, okay. Of reading a lot about because <laughs> I'm trying to there there were weren't they. Uh, didn't he do some stuff like going around to different cultures, showing different emotional faces or so, something yeah, that, yeah. along so, those lines? And it was, it was, I remember him doing some kind of landmark stuff in the, that realm. And then it being like uh, over the last 10 or 20 years becoming like controversial or a lot of people kind of arguing with. Am, am I in the yeah ballpark? yeah yeah yeah? So this is like um, the kinds of studies that have been done with facial expressions, right? And so facial expression research is like huge in emotion research, right? Or it has been huge in emotion research. And um, th- so a lot of the research that has have been done by basic emotion theorists, you might say, were like really really convincing. Right. So they went to different cultures and showed like still pictures of different kinds of facial expressions. And then they gave um, a list of words to the um, subjects and asked them to, you know, and oftentimes it would, they were translated words. So it was like, you know, def- de- depending on the culture, they would have the word that is the analog to um, the word in English that the emotion researchers were, were concerned with. And so they would um, ask them to pick right? Which word, right, identifies this specific emotion, things like that. Or they would be given a word and they would ask which face identifies this specific emotion, right? And it, it, you know, a lot of results seem to be really, really robust, right? So that like, there seem to be a lot of cross-cultural comparisons that can be made between the kinds of, um, answers that people are giving in like one culture versus another. So they're like, Hey, look, here's evidence for basic emotion theory being true. Right. And then what happened was there were criticisms of the methods that were used to do these studies. Right. So some of the studies were like forced choice studies. Right. So that, um, you would give the subject a number of, um, you know, choices and they couldn't opt out number one. Right. So they had to choose one. Right. And then, um, what, what ended up happening was that some of them would choose based on, and this is actually a study that, um, James A. Russell did, right. Would choose based on, um, a, a process of elimination. Right. So based on their experiences of the past, kinds of questions that they received, right? They somehow figured out like, oh, here, this is the emotion that it's probably the one that they're, you know, the, the, 
um, scientists are looking for, right? So because of that kind of research that kind of um, opened up, right, the prob- the methodological problems, right, with um, fa- research in facial expressions, right, um, now research on facial expressions have been quite controversial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I wouldn't say they're completely bad. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a fair amount of cross culture emotions, seemingly, and then there's also individual uh, or there's there's differences within cultures. Yeah, uh, yeah. as well, it seems like there's a bit of both. And yeah, uh, yeah, my yeah. limited understanding. <laughs> so, so going back to the, um, the eliminationism. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so can. Can you, where were we with that? Oh, so that was, that was, um, Jim's. So, uh, limitivism is Jim's kind of category. Right. Um, and I think, you know, it would be interesting. So here's the thing is like, you might ask like, what are academics like interested in when we're researching emotions? Right. And, you know, of course we want to say like, we're interested in the truth, right? Like we want to know what, what is really real kind of stuff. Right. But I, I think it's important for people um, who are not familiar with the way in which academics do research, right. To understand that in order for us to achieve this, right. Um, it's important for, for there to be academics who are willing to argue for those positions that seem highly controversial and could be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Because the idea is that if they can argue really well for that position, right, then that puts constraints on, right, the requirements that the other positions need to fulfill, right? So that these four categories, right, and those who pursue research in these four, like taking up one of these four categories as their perspective, right? Um, we, we don't want to eliminate any of them, right? We actually want to foster research in all of them, right? Because they all, the debate that occurs among the four together, right, is what allows us to figure out what's actually true, mm. right? So I would say, you know, like, you know, not many people are limitless, but I would say, you know, it might be a, a worthwhile thing, right? If you're interested in motion research, right? To take on the banner of limitism and see like how, where the, the, will that get us, right? Like how far can that go um, in a reasonable way? And what, uh, uh, what does the eliminative realism yeah, so eliminative yeah. realism, um, this is, so the people that I knew, mostly associate with eliminative realism is um, Andreas Scarantino and Paul Griffiths. And so their view is basically that um, it's realist in the sense that they think that emotions are real, right? So that there is, you can say, a kind of like system or something like that, like, you know, in hum- human beings, right? Um, neural systems that work with our our um, physiological systems as well, right? Um, which, um, so that they are there, you can call the like emotions do exist for a certain extent, right? However, what they deny is that um, emotions exist in the way that people think that they exist, right? So they deny the, the kind of like characterization. And I think typically, right, um, and studies have been done with, uh, like in the United States, where most people seem to have, when they think about emotions, they think about like basic motion theory emotions, right? Like that seems to be the standard model that like just regular people seem to have when they think about what emotions are, right? And so um, Sc- Andrea Scarantino and Paul Griffiths, they reject, right, the standard kind of way of understanding what emotions are. So they want to eliminate, right, this this kind of, understanding, right, basic emotion theory, understanding of what emotions are, but they want to retain the realism that is in realism and say, no, there, there is actually, you know, a real like emotion system, which we can empirically study, right? Um, but they don't want to characterize it in terms of basic motion theories, characterization. So that's like eliminative realism. And so what you can do is you can take, right, different theories and different disciplines and like place them under 
one of these four categories. And uh, so you're a realist. What, what if someone asks you, what's an emotion um, outside of academia? Let's say someone outside of academia, but someone that's willing. <laughs> I think that's a really so, difficult. <laughs> so uh, someone, uh, someone, someone that's that's willing is someone like my listener that is 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 uh, probably. I mean, I do have some academics that listen and everything, but I also have a lot of factory workers that just really like learning about science and are super just naturally curious people and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So how would you, how would you describe uh, your view of what an emotion is to someone that is outside of academia, but science curious nonetheless? Outside of academia, but science curious. Okay. So I would say um, it's um, an evolutionarily adaptive system right, that has both cognitive and non-cognitive components that um, bring our physiological, like they coordinate our physiological responses towards um, uh, resolving certain, and this is very much like BET, right, basic motion theory, right, towards resolving certain problems um, that we come across, right, in our daily lives with like people and things and so on that we value. Right. So um, I think that uh, the value component is actually a very more philosophical um, approach to like a BET, like basic motion theory way of looking at emotions. Right. So it's like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's how I would describe. I mean, very, very, very similarly. I, I mean, with a with a gentle reminder that we are vehicles for our genes, and ultimately that's kind of a big part of the ultimate goal of of what those those drives are executing and behaviors. And but, yeah, but I don't know exactly what that means in terms of the complexity of human lives, right? So this is like when we were talking mm-hmm. about how politics can be related to evolutionary biology, right? Because it's like, right, you have um, adaptive, like, pressures, right, that work on gene selection, right? Although there's, like, epigenetic, environmental, selective stuff that occurs as well. So that's, like, kind of difficult to say. But when we're talking about, like, like gene- so let's, right, so we'll say someone who is emotionally intelligent, right, you might say has a better chance of getting their genes selected for reproduction compared to someone who is not emotionally intelligent, right? Because if you're emotionally intelligent, then you're going to be someone who is better able to cooperatively work with people, right? You're going to be better able to um, get people who are attracted to you, their interests, right? Like convince them to have sex with you, things like that, right? So there's like, there's lots of If you're jealous, you may be able to... uh, (laughs) Maintain uh, relations. uh, Yeah. (laughs) So there's like a lot of like, practical benefits, right? And like knowing or being able to um, respond emotionally in a a good way, right? In a way that is, one might say productive, right? So I think like there's this, there's this question about, you know, in terms of how like those kinds of things that human beings do, how we respond emotionally, how we also respond, not just emotionally, but like politically, right? Like, you know, how does that affect, right? Like biologically, what, like what kinds of individuals, like we end up having in our culture, right? And I'm like, I'm not saying, right? So this is a very social constructionist kind of way of thinking about things, right? And the effects that like emotions and our other kinds of values, right? Like we were talking about capitalism might have on like, the kinds of individuals, right? And the way our psychology develops within a culture, right? I'm not going to say that like, you know, I'm not saying like every culture, like, you know, everyone is like this in this culture, right? Or everyone is like that in this culture. However, like, I think we have to grant, right? That um, culture makes a difference, right? Culture makes a difference in psychology. Culture makes a difference in values, right? And all those things make a difference in terms of like, you know, 
who you end up procreating with, right? Things like that. So. And the culture also uh, uh, emerged as kind of a phenotypic uh, outcome of our genes as well. And our, our genes influenced our culture, the, yeah. the way that it, culture emerged as well. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, certainly, certainly, like what our what many of our systems, not just emotion, kind of uh, were selected for originally and the messiness of what they're doing on a given day and an individual isn't always in the ends of like passing passing on a gene or or whatever else on on in every single instance but i think it's it's a large part of uh what what set up the um the 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 spectrum of emotional ex- expression within um, an individual and, and, and what individuals express what, and yeah. you know, is, is, yeah. is, is very, yeah. uh, it, it, just like you have a propensity to, uh, like maybe have a genetic predisposition toward Alzheimer's or something. I, I think this, yeah. S- yeah, yeah, people have a, uh, predisposition toward different personalities and yeah, emotions definitely. as well, yeah. but then of course can be influenced by uh like alzheimer's can be influenced by alcohol consumption mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. can be influenced by culture or whatever and, yeah, and yeah. i would say <laughs> emotions are all kind of within that as well or yeah, are we yeah. like yeah yeah no uh, no yeah that's definitely like i totally agree so it's like uh, one thing that i always think about is like you know so you can have a culture where it's like um thought that being very like having um very extreme emotions right um, is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have a culture where it's like, Oh, you know, if you're like very emotional, right. Um, that's not something that people find attractive. That's not something that, um, people encourage and so on and so forth. So that's looked upon negatively. Right. So the idea is like, you have a culture where like being a stoic, right. So like having a stoic response, like is, is preferred. Right. And then you have, like, if you have an individual who happens to be right, they're, they're just emotional, like highly emotional people, right? Like the person just can't help. Like I would say I'm kind of to a certain extent, like highly emotional, right? Cause it's like, I can't help but express my emotions in a very like, you know, like you know, people know when I'm like sad or, de- you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and uh, you would, you would think, right. So if I like all of a sudden was born in this kind of culture, right. Like uh, my, my, genetics, right. That, that is partly responsible for that aspect of me, right. Might be selected against. Right. So that you have a population of people who genetically, right. And I'm not saying like, this is, you know, you know, that emotions can be, because we haven't figured that part out yet. Right. But, um, you might have certain genetic characteristics, right. That, um, do work on like emotional expression, like how emotional someone is right? Or one's ability to control their emotional responses, right? That get selected out, right? Or that gets influenced in a certain way. Um, Although I will say, right, like, I have no idea in terms of like, I'm pretty sure we're not there yet with the research on any ties between like genes and uh, like emotional like capacities and expressions. Um, I know that there's research on like autism, right? And emotions, Um, and you know, you can make this connection or try to make this connection between, um, genetics for autism and then emotions. But I will say, I think, and I think things have gotten a lot better now, but when I first started research in, um, emotion, um, and I looked at the autism research, I was, I was like really upset, right? (laughs) Because I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe that, you know, this area of research, the way that they, um, analyze their data and interpret it, right? I thought was really, really problematic, especially with this idea that um, people would label, right? They would judge um, those who are on the autistic spectrum as being emotionally like, um, um, emotionally, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or like to say, like they had, you know, they had an inability or something like that to like recognize emotions or, you know, even respond emotionally. And I was just like, 
uh, no, <laughs> like that's that's right. like not what your data shows, right? Might um, be the opposite in a lot of cases. Yeah, it's like you're not, you know, they're like, you know, you have people on like the autistic spectrum is also kind of, um, you know, complicated, right? Because you have like this really broad range of um, people, right, that fall under the autistic spectrum, and it's called a spectrum for a certain reason, and like you know, where exactly on the, on the spectrum they lie is very difficult to like figure out like, well, what does that mean really? Right. But I think like in terms of just like the kinds of abilities and things like that, the way in which the research was interpreting, um, autistic people's like responses, right. It was like, oh, they have an emotional deficit. Right. But it's like, well, how do you know they have an emotional deficit? Because they 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 were responding emotion. It's just not the the typical way, right? So it's not the typical way that someone might respond, right? So you have to ask, like, does that mean they weren't responding emotionally, or does that just mean that there are different ways in which one can emotionally respond, right? And I'm I'm more of the person in the second group, right? I'm like. No, it's not that they're not, they don't have a deficit, right? It's just the way in which their emotion system operates a little bit differently. But that doesn't mean that it, they're not getting information that, you know, is necessary or is legitimate or anything like that. Now, there could be differences in terms of, like, you might say, fineness of grain, right? And I will say, yeah, in the, in the, in the sense of, like, like you were saying, right? Like, like they might be better at it <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, I think, um, so do you watch the show, um, Young Sheldon or like I, the show? Like, I, 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 I've, I've seen, I've seen the, probably a total of maybe an hour or so of each show. I get, I, I get the gist. Okay. Okay. So granted, this is like, you know, fiction, right. And like, you know, I'm not going to say like they accurately portray like someone, um, who's on the autistic spectrum, right. With Sheldon that character but that's like so that's what his character is supposed to be is someone who, who's on the autistic spectrum but if you think about it right um it, it's i don't think except they did have an episode where like he admitted he was unable to figure out like people's emotions right but i think if you like when i watch it i'm like and i and i listen to like his responses and exchanges and stuff like that it's it's not that he's not capable of understanding people's emotional reactions or responses, right? But it's just that he doesn't respond to them in the way that, right, is what James Williams, right, Jim, um, James Williams, what Jim Russell would say, right? Socially expected. Is a, is a script. They don't follow the script, right? right? And I think, I think that really needs to be attended to in emotion research, right? So this idea that, you know, simply because people do not s respond to a certain type of emotion in the way that is expected, right? Doesn't mean that they're not processing that emotion and interpreting that emotion and understand exactly how that emotion is working, right? And especially if you think about the fact that um, emotions are kinds of scripts, right? There are ways in which like our interactions, we know how to structure our interactions, right? Um, to this extent, it's actually really, really important for us to know how to disengage from the scripts, right? Because some of these scripts might be really detrimental, right? They may be like um, laden with like cognitive biases, right? And like, you know, racial biases and so on and so forth. So it, it's really important actually to be able to say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not, here's how I would respond, but I'm not going to, right? Because maybe I understand something about that situation to help me interpret that in a way that like, no, I'm not going to play that game, right? So, so yeah, I think <laughs> there has to be a lot more, more careful studies in how like, um, people's emotional responses, right? Like how they work um, in emotion research. But things have improved, well, I will say. Well, great. Well, maybe <laughs> we'll expand on these, uh, these, these topics uh, in the, in the, in the future. Oh, on, that'd be uh, awesome. On yeah. another episode. I would, I would love to, uh, I would love to get into the, um, 
the messiness of politics and race and Very cool. uh, and other other things that we don't uh, talk about enough on this show sometimes. So, awesome. Um, so yeah, this is this has been a terrific episode, and I I know my listeners are both because of the um, insane number of subjects that we talk about on this show. A lot of my listeners are interested in interdisciplinary approaches to things and also into uh, emotions quite a bit. So everyone check out Interdisciplinary Foundations for the Science of Emotion. (laughs) Sorry, I said it plural again before that. Caught myself. Boom. Nailed it. Um, uh, um, Cecilia Moon is has been the guest. Is there anywhere else that you would like to uh, direct people? Um, um to- yeah. So um, I'm not sure exactly. I have a, a web page. Um, so if you go to sites.google.com site or forward slash site forward slash m u n c e c i l e a. Um, that should take you to my website. I used to have like my We're going to put that link in the description. It's going to okay. be nice and That's easy awesome. for people. Yeah. So I used to like pay for my own, like, what is it called? Um, address. Right. But then I mm-hmm. was like, I ran out of money. So just like, I'm just going to do the free Google sites. Um, Damn web-based. capitalism <laughs> rearing its ugly head again. <laughs> well, Cecilia, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thank you so much as well, Shane, for inviting me. Um, this was a, a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I hope to be able to make it out to that festival you're talking about. And, oh, yeah. Um, we are talking about the yeah. Mind, Under, <laughs> uh, Mind Under Festival just before, uh, before the show in Raleigh, September uh, 9th through 12th. And, yeah. Uh, so I, I will make a of your little Patreon note. member as well. Yeah, make make a note of. Yeah, a, of I will. It. And I actually know someone else um, who who would totally love going there. So yeah. Yeah, we're trying to. I, I was I was telling. This, well, this is. It, 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 People are going to think I paid you to say all of this. It just <laughs> C- Cecilia was uh, uh, was we were just having a bit of conversation before the recording of various things that each of us had going on in our lives, and I was telling her about the uh, the festival that uh, I'm putting together and how we're we're trying to have uh, one aspect of it with with artists and everything else, one aspect of it being. Um, uh, that there'll be like a book fair kind of vibe, uh, with it as well. So if you're still in Louisville at that time, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not crazy far to shoot over to. Yeah. I don't think I'll be in Louisville at that. So my contract ends in, um, at the end of May. Um, so Mm -hmm. I, I, like I said, I have, I have no idea. (laughs) I have, plans right i have many many backup plans for what what i might i could be doing um yeah. or where i could be but right now i have no idea exactly but it's probably not going to be louisville i don't think just because it's all right well it's maybe it'll be even closer <laughs> maybe you won't make it at all and this is uh, all just uh, a plug that benefits me and <laughs> Uh, only me, and that's <laughs> that's great too. Uh, uh, Cecilia, you're really terrific. Thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, thank you, Shane. Have a good one. Thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week. Okie dokie, everybody. I can't tell you what episode is coming out next week because uh, I've sorting out a few things we uh, i have uh i have one recorded i have several lined up and like i said i'm i'm trying to i'm i'm hoping to really soon um do my first uh test run of having someone do a uh be in like a media department or something so my guest can also have um uh high uh production value on their end of things and so it's something i've been uh feeling out for a while and so i'm gonna trying to start in one one place and see if i can get it lined up with a few guests and then uh, sort out all the various things that come up from that and then slowly over the next few months keep on experimenting with that um with 
uh, other guests here and there. So I'm excited to get experimenting with that. So I don't know exactly what guests will be coming up next week, but um, I'm sure it'll be a fun show regardless. Uh, please support the show by going on patreon.com slash Shane Moss. And again, if you do that, you'll get a discord link and you can hear more about the Mind Under Matter Campout Festival where there'll be a live Here We Are and um, me doing stand-up and all sorts of fun things. So check that out. Super excited about it. And um, and the other thing that I was going to tell you what is it? Oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, keep keep your eye out. If you go to the mindunderpod.com website and you'll see the festival tab where you can go and enter your email address, um, there's a link in the description below for that. Um, you'll also get updates and uh, a, a little a little southeast tour that uh, Ramin and I are planning on making happen uh, probably in June. So more details on that really soon. And those of you that listen all the way to the end, you are, of course, my favorites.